Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. So just to introduce myself, I'm Ruth Stock, obviously, and I am a member of the team at St Luke in the City. And uh, I have been in this team for roughly four years. Uh, and I am now employed by the local church, by the team itself. And uh, my job is to do new things in non-traditional places, really to try and... You're looking alarmed now. <laughs> St Luke's team is just discovering what I meant to do. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Discovered. But I am also... Um, researching for this professional doctorate in practical theology and uh, I'm actually in the fourth year of something like seven and uh, I know this goes on forever but the whole idea of, of a professional doctorate in practical theology is that you research your own practice so what I am seeking to research is one of those non-traditional practices in an unusual space and that's part of what I'll be telling you about. The title, A Post-Evangelical um, evangelical Perspective on Mission, is aha, light, maybe. Yay, some. Fantastic. It's really, I try and avoid labels. But my story, and this is in part a personal story, this label of, of saying that I'm post-evangelical, is that I was not brought up in a Christian household. This is starting to sound like a testimony, isn't it? But I, I became a Christian. I, I started my, or I acknowledged that I was on a Christian journey um, in my early 30s at an evangelical church. I didn't know it was evangelical because I thought they were all like that. What did I know? So I discovered myself to be a conservative evangelical without really knowing how I'd got there. And went through the process of selection for ordination and then to theological college in a very evangelical college, Wycliffe Hall, surrounded by other evangelical ordinands, and then went for a curacy in a very evangelical parish in, in Toxteth, and then became team vicar in that same parish. But it was as I journeyed, often with people who I had known for many years who were not Christians, that the questions started to come up and the certainties that I had known as a conservative evangelical started to disappear and it's a very uncomfortable feeling as those of you who, who might identify as a post-evangelical will know you really feel you are losing something you really feel that you, you've somehow lost that certainty lost that community that you used to belong to in which you could make judgments about what was right and what was wrong and everything becomes a lot more grey but also a lot more real. Anyway, that is my story and why I identify as a post-evangelical and that may be something that we want to talk about afterwards at the end of this, uh, of this talk. So, mm, what did we say was this? That one? Yes, that's the right one. So this is a, th a journey, but it's both theological and it's personal. And this interaction with people whom I will, which I will describe as we go on, is part of that journey. I do not feel that I am somebody who comes with an answer that I need people to accept. I journey with people and their perceptions change me as much as I think the practices that I introduce may change them. So these are just the titles um, that as we go through of the various slides. There are elements, there are three elements really. First, as I say, of personal journey and the practice of evangelism, but also of context. How are we where we are? And the the idea of fresh expressions of church, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, some of you may be totally bored with, um, but that is the rationale for my job, 
that was how it came about, was so that we could kind of produce these fresh expressions of church, which of course now get measured on church statistics, so they must be okay, mustn't they? <laughs> It is also about the voices, hearing the voices of some of the participants in a particular practice which I facilitate, which I will describe to you. And it is their voices which, to me, are the most important part of this presentation. But the context first. An anxious church, a church in decline which is still trying to fool itself that things can turn around. In 1994, Grace Davey wrote a very influential book, which she called Believing, Not Belonging, where she looked at the disconnect between the people who said they were Christians at that time, about 80% of the population, and the people who actually attended church, and said, well, if there's all these people who say they're Christians, what are they doing not coming to church? And she coined this, uh, this phrase as a as kind of shorthand for that mismatch of attending but saying they are Christian, not attending and saying they're Christian. And that's something that the church, I think, um, consoled itself with by saying, ah, oh, well, even if people don't come and the numbers are declining, and they certainly are, as you can see, Actually, they still believe. They still, somehow, they are people we can connect with. They are still our people. And that was the thought. And indeed, it was the thought until, really, people started looking at, in detail, census figures and the surveys that have been done subsequently. This is just one survey done by Tier Fund. And it shows the age profile of people who attend church. If you were born in the 1920s or 30s, you were probably going to be raised in church. You would have raised, been raised to go to church. But look at the drop-off of those who now attend monthly. But there's still a strong belief in a personal God. But look at the way that reduces. And those born in the 1940s and 50s, and the 60s and 70s, and the 80s and 90s. Look, especially, not only is the attendance dropping, but also being raised in church. In other words, being brought as children. But also, so does the belief in a personal God, which what rises is a belief in God as some sort of impersonal force, the force of creation, for instance, however people understand that. And the 2011 census in England and Wales shows that actually at that particular point, 59%, so less than 60% of the usual residents actually identify themselves as Christian. This is a drop of 12% since 2001. So in 10 years, 12% drop in the number of people who identify as Christians. They also noted um, on the census figures that the, that Christians have the oldest age profile of all the mainstream religions. 22% of those who identify as Christians are over 65 or 65 and over. And you can see, as Steve Hollinghurst says, looking at that, that tier fund survey, in four generations, there is no longer this underlying sense that these are our people. We cannot say that. We cannot fool ourselves any longer. But it was out of this context of decline that, in particular, the Mission Shaped Church report was published in 2004. That came out of the background, in fact, of church planting. That's really what had spawned that report 10 years earlier. There had been a report on church planting, particularly about the idea of church planting over parish boundaries. <gasps> and um, basically, this report was saying, it's OK, church planting is what we need. Look at the decline. But it also listed, as some of you are aware, various other ways in which people who were not 
normally coming to church could be engaged with. And unlike most general synod reports, which get put on a shelf and gather dust, actually this one was immensely popular, sold thousands of copies, and was actually read by a lot of people because it was a permission-giving document. It gave permission for, at the very least, for bishops to create mission orders or posts. My post was one of them created, if you like, or certainly paid for initially by, by Bishop James Jones when he was here. So it, it might be theologi theologically light, as it was, and there are many criticisms of the report on that basis, not least from John Hull, um, <laughs> as you might expect, and perfectly reasonably. I mean, I agree with most of what he says, but um, we're not here simply to critique the report. We know the problems of it. But their premise, or the premise of the, the group that produced this, was that we are in a different cultural context to the one in which people could say, or the church could reassure itself that these are our people, they may not come, but they're ours. And um, you just have to, we know this, don't we? You just have to look at the change in the public and media attitudes since the 1940s and 50s. The change in attitude between the televising of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, which I'm sure many of you will have seen snippets of at least, and the reverential Dimbleby voiceover, and the televising of Jerry Springer the opera. Just think of the change in attitude that has taken place between those two events. So, what we have, according to the report, is a disconnected people. In that Mission Shape Church report, they defined the population as 20% of, of them are regular church attenders. By that, they meant once a month, usually. People who go to church at some point, 40%, they reckon, were de-churched, or lapsed, and 40% unchurched, for whom church is totally foreign. Mind you, within that 40%, there are also adherents of other religions. But notice the language of this report. All these people are being defined in relation to church, not in relation to God or a faith system, but in relation to church. To me, it is also language which belittles. It defines people by what they're not. And it does not take them seriously. And it sees them, these people what don't come, are the problem. And we need to do something about the problem of them what don't come. Let's make no mistake. People described as de-churched, lapsed for whatever reason, whether open or closed in the, in the report's language, in other words, whether we can talk to them or not, they are not lapsed or de-churched because they don't know what church is like. They are de-churched because they do know what church is like and they have voted with their feet. That is the issue we are dealing with. Also, I think there, there is another phenomenon going on here, which is that although many people do not have an actual experience of church, uh, they all have a virtual experience of church because of the, um, the, the media attention to you know, anything shocking that happens with a vicar, you know, front page news, and also TV programs like The Vicar of Dibley, Rev. What a great program that is, but anyway. I digress. But um, so people, people's experience of church is not simply coming to church. It is a, a whole cultural experience of church. But we ask ourselves, what is the goal of mission? And surely it is not to have a relationship with church. It is to have for people to have a relationship with God. The church is just a particular cultural expression of that 
relationship being worked out in practice. As Rowan Williams said, he has some lovely quotes, Rowan Williams, it's important not to confuse mission with adding recruits to the institution. How true. Why don't we listen? So the people that we are looking at, the people that I'm talking to and who interest me, because we can't all reach out to everything, and make no mistake, I don't decry the kinds of fresh expressions, however defined, which are a reaching out to people who are, if you like, on the fringe of church, people who might come occasionally, can we get them to come and be regular members, and preferably, from the institution's perspective, paid up members, because it is all about money. But the people that I'm talking to and wanting to reach out to are the people who often define themselves as spiritual but not religious. This is a, a little sort of title, um, sort of shorthand way of talking about people who have some kind of spiritual inclination but would never go near a church to find it. The trouble with talking about people as people do themselves as spiritual but not religious, I mean it begs questions of what do you mean by spiritual and what do you mean by religious, but maybe that's another discussion, discussion we can have. Um, Healers and Woodhead actually uh, Trying to think how long ago that was after Grace Davy. So I think early, early this century, Paul Helis and Linda Woodhead did a very interesting study with others uh, in Kendall. And they really talked to everybody and anybody they could talk to. And they particularly looked at the distinction between those who attended some form of traditional religion but those who had some form of spiritual practice, what they called the holistic milieu. It was a bit of a false distinction because in their holistic milieu they had things like Teze worship and Iona groups which we might think are pretty mainstream Christian really but I suppose that depends on your definitions. But from that they concluded that there was still some form of spiritual revolution going on, that there was still this spirituality gene, if you like. There's a God instinct it's, which is still intact. So they were still building on this idea of Grace Davies, of believing but not belonging, but becoming more tenuous about what the belief was. Of course, that is highly disputed by people like Steve Bruce and other secularists who will still argue, no, no, religion and spirituality will wither away. It's just a one generation thing. It hasn't, basically. It's still here. The big questions are still there. And a very interesting piece of research was done in Coventry Diocese by Yvonne Richmond, um, who went and basically just interviewed people on the street, anybody who talked to her who didn't go to church, about spiritual experience and what was their understanding of spirituality. She found that people enjoyed being asked about their spiritual experience. This is one person said, if I talked about this to anyone else, they think I was crazy. Spirituality is not an acceptable topic of conversation for most people. Certainly not in an ordinary conversation down the pub. And that's where this lovely quote comes from. The church could be tried in a court of justice and found guilty of killing off spirituality. And that is the attitude which many, many people have of the kind of people I talk to who are spiritually seeking, I would say, but they would never, ever look in a church because the church for them has indeed killed off spirituality. There are an, an, any number of um, criticisms one can make of new spiritualities, some of them old, repackaged, often called New Age, but that is a bit of a, a fuzzy thing. Some people will describe it as New Age. Often Christians describe it as New Age because they don't actually know what it is. Pagan, perhaps. But paganism has a huge, huge range of, of adherents and different practices. I prefer to talk about new spiritualities or secular spiritualities. 
because they are not ones that are coming out of traditional religions, although they do pick up bits of traditional religions. And it is this, if you like, postmodern, to quote that horrible word, pick and mix idea of taking a bit here and a bit there and bringing it together, whatever makes you feel good, is the, uh, the usual way of, of describing it. This makes me feel good to have my crystal in the window and to have whatever it is I have and to, you know, burn my herbs and smudge the place. But we live in a culture in which Christianity too is, if you like, broken up. There are shards of Christian understanding, of Christian belief, of Christianese, Christian practices out there in the world being picked up alongside all these other fragments of different religions. Christianity itself has its own fragmentations. There is, there is no longer for many people the sense that you go to your parish church. You probably go past your parish church, past several others, to go to one that suits you, makes you feel good, whatever that particular brand of Christianity or practice might be. And then there is also the criticism that the new spiritualities are very taken over by global capitalism. There's a fascinating book um, by Carrot and King, if you want to read up more on this. And they are absolutely scathing about um, capitalism, picking up the idea of spirituality to sell whatever. You know, it's just the latest scent of candle. But you find it in many spiritual practices as well, which sell themselves. I, I saw just recently um, an, an e-newsletter from the Patanjali meditation people who meet at St. Luke's, where I do some practices myself. And, and there was somebody's blog on that saying, spirituality made me wealthy. And he, <laughs> so we have prosperity meditation, not just prosperity gospel. That spirituality, if you like, becomes a toolbox that anybody can take bits out of for whatever practice, you know, whether it's for your business, for your marketing campaign, you know, what is the spirituality of marketing? And we've all seen the books. You only have to go into a bookshop and, and look at the various things that are there. There is a spirituality for every and any aspect of life. But if this is the culture in which we are, and in my terms, the kinds of people that I am seeking to interact with, the people who do not come to church, who fall into that 40% totally unchurched people. How are we to do that? And I think there is a really interesting way of thinking about this, finding ways of finding points of congruity, points at which those practices that they have, those ideas, and the ideas of Christian tradition come together. Two people who've been highly influential on me. One is Steve Hollinghurst. One of the things that started me off on this journey was going to Greenbelt some years ago and hearing Steve, who works for the Church Army now, as a missioner, um, hearing him say, for many, many years, and particularly at some of the big charismatic conferences uh, at the beginning of, of, the, um, of this millennium, there have been many prophecies of revival. There have been visions and there have been words of knowledge about this great outpouring of the spiritual revival in the UK. And then nothing happened. And Steve said, it has happened, but it's called the new age. That, to him, is the spiritual revival. And the church has missed it because we have been looking elsewhere. 
so he puts it more politely in, in his book, what if God was enabling a great spiritual awakening not in the church but outside it? This is pick up on the idea of Helas and Woodhead that there is this spiritual revolution happening but it's not going to the traditional places. And Pete Ward, who, who writes in about, you may have heard of Liquid Church, that's his, his thing. The central missiological issue for the church in the West is how it will react to the mediation of the spiritual in popular culture. That's where we need to be, looking at the real culture around us. <coughs> Martin Warner, when he was at um, St. Paul's Cathedral, was intrigued by the way in which people would come in just fairly randomly, just come into St. Paul's and he would say, what are they looking for? Because they would all hush their voices and they would all sort of say, oh, I can feel something spiritual here. What's happening for them? And he talked about these points of congruity that he felt were, were in existence between the Christian story and their story. The idea of rest or Sabbath, of words of transformation, the idea of transformation, and the hope that it brings, of remembering, of bringing together what has been split apart, what has been lost. The provision of a safe space, a healing space, and the idea of beauty, a beautiful space. And that's an idea that, that I have worked with in some of the research that I've done, this idea of finding these points of congruity. And one that I have found and that I am working with will be known to many of you. As St. Luke in the city, the bombed out church, a very edgy place, as you might know, in the city centre, but there is no obvious city centre church in Liverpool, is there? They were kind of gone. Um, this is the most obvious one, but no longer owned by the church, actually owned by the city council. Um, still consecrated, but as I'm sure you may have heard, and Les was telling me just now, it's been on Radio Merseyside this morning, an interview with Joe Anderson about, uh, is it going to close, isn't it going to close? Well, there's a new trust being formed, and uh, there will be a, a request for... for what do you call it, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, uh, in due course, so keep alert. You will, it'll be on the St Bride's website as well. The issue, of course, is that the walls are crumbling and need a considerable amount of money to keep them stable, keep it safe, and um, the council has no money. And in the meantime, there is a trust which exists which has just enough money to pay the insurance. Not to do anything else, just pay the insurance. That's really all it can do at the moment, which means you can actually open it and go in. But there is a garden. It's, uh, it's a safe space. It brings back, it remembers as a space what it was built for. It's a healing space. It was St. Luke's. It's next to Rodney Street. It was the place where the, the medical profession used to come and worship. That was their space, is my understanding of it. But it's also a tourist attraction and a place where street drinkers sit off, as you will know if you've been there. But within that space, it's a place where I have started some years ago, a couple of years ago, a particular practice. And this is where it becomes very personal. Because this practice has arisen, it's called Ruach Blessing, if you can, yeah, yeah, it's come up pretty well on that. And it it is something which has developed, I have developed, but it's kind of got a life of its own. But I realize that this, which is a missional encounter, deliberately aimed at people who would never go to normal church spiritual practices, I realize that it is very much about who I am and my experiences to date. It's not a system. And probably if, if I wasn't there, it wouldn't happen. Or if someone else were there, it would happen differently. It's a meditation practice. And you can see there the different kind of influences on me, from Anglican liturgy to Christian meditation, 
my own Tai Chi practice. I've been a Tai Chi practitioner for, I don't know, 15 something years. And also more recently, an awareness of breathing and body sensations which have come from a mindfulness practice. And I and another colleague here have trained as, uh, as teachers of mindfulness-based practices. We do that with whoever comes. There are a few regulars, but basically whoever turns up, which might be some of the street drinkers if they're sober enough to stay for more than two minutes, innocent tourists who just look in and think, oh, what's going on? People who drop in from surrounding offices because they see it advertised outside. That's the only place it's advertised. It's simply there for people to drop into. It's a practice which is open to everyone because it's very gentle. I introduce it, I encourage people to join in, and I demonstrate and show people what to do and remind them of the mantra of breathing in, the ruach, which I describe as the breath of life, the spirit of God. I explain it as a, as a Hebrew word that, that means spirit, breath, wind. We breathe that in, so on an in-breath we will use that sound, ruach, and on an out-breath, blessing, as we breathe out a blessing on all living beings, which is a deliberate echo of a Buddhist prayer. At the end, after about 40 minutes, because we've had a warm-up first, so it's just under the, the hour between one and two on a Thursday lunchtime, at the end, I will say to people, you know, from the tradition I come from, the Jesus tradition, all you need to do to live well is to do justly, love kindness, and walk quietly with your creator. And then a blessing. I always say, let's go in peace, be blessed, and be a blessing to others. And if for any reason I, I forget that blessing, or something happens, or somebody is talking, the regulars will say to me, where's our blessing then? Why haven't we had our blessing? We already have this little ritual. But that's the only way in which I identify myself as a Christian. And then invite people for coffee afterwards. And over coffee, at Bold Street Coffee, very excellent coffee, I can tell you, we talk about the session, what was it like? What did you feel? You know, what, what was around for you today? Anything happened during the week? Anything you want to... And sometimes we talk about spirituality and sometimes we talk about the price of fish. And sometimes they ask me my story. Why am I still in the church? And I can tell them and give honest answers to that. But I don't do it in order to give my testimony. I do it in order to reach out to people and have this non-judgmental, fully attended listening opportunity. Because what I think we're doing on a Thursday does not need to speak. People have an encounter with sacred space which happens when we stop listening to the constant babble that is going on in our heads that our society puts there we have the opportunity to talk about it later but in the quiet and the peacefulness and the stilling of our busy busy minds we practice the presence of God even that God that we do not yet know that God is not absent from that encounter and it's from the regular participants that uh, 18 months ago I had um, some focus groups and what the participants said of their spirituality they talked about I asked them particularly to talk about two things firstly something where they were um, an experience in which they felt totally at peace content fulfilled and on the other hand a spiritual experience using those words when they talked about 
that first experience of being completely fulfilled, aware, and uh, fully present. They talked about natural images, about flights of birds, about the sense of the seasons passing and the sprouting leaves, and of everything being in balance. One of the people said, walking home, I suddenly had a feeling of everything being in perfect balance, all as it should be. The elements, the moon, all created energy. It was peaceful. Everything slowed down. And it was incredible to witness this moment in time. I felt it was balanced like a gyroscope. I love this little point. And that is not somebody who ever goes to church. And yet what I think he's talking about, and the point of congruity, if you like, is the shalom of God. This sense of harmony, of perfect balance. This is a conversation that can continue. That's what he's experiencing at that moment. The other key thing that they talked about in, in terms of that moment of, of complete awareness and fulfillment was a silencing of the inner critic, the inner dialogue that went on constantly for them. They were all conscious of that, that voice in the head, that, that constant self-talk, often highly critical, and the sense of feeling themselves part of something greater, usually in this case a natural phenomenon of being in you know, a mountainous landscape or a beautiful sunset or whatever it might have been. This sense of being in that present moment something greater than themselves that they were in touch with in some way the transformative experience that Warner talks about. Interestingly, when they talked about spiritual experience, used the word spiritual or spirituality, it was a very difficult word for people who had had a, a religious upbringing. One person there had been brought up, in her words, strict Roman Catholic, and found it very difficult even to think about the word spirituality. But very interesting image that, that somebody came up with was, was that of Spider-Man. He said, I'm like Spider-Man. I'm shooting out strands from my wrist, seeking to overlap with other people's strands as they search for a spiritual path. And sometimes I can join with them. And sometimes they join with me. This idea of connectivity was very strong. There's also this sense of looking for spiritual people. And I think to counter the arguments of, of people who would say that new spirituality is all about private feel good, yes, to an extent it is private in the sense it is self chosen, but it is also this seeking to connect, to connect with others who are on a spiritual path, recognizing that we're not all the same but that there is wisdom to be had. And also, yes, it is consumerist in the sense that it is self-chosen, but there is also the sense that there is a journey of growth and a desire to create spaces to be honest with ourselves. And those are the words that somebody used. I want a space where I can be honest with myself. So, to me, this practice forms an ambiguous encounter. It's the soft witness of hospitality. There's me offering a practice in which they can join. But a practice that will make a positive change, a way of living skillfully. It works. It makes a day-to-day -day difference in people's lives. Plus, there is a way of going further if people choose. We offer opportunities to meditate alongside others in a wider community, some Christians, some not. So to that extent, it is good news that we are being as we offer something which makes a real difference in people's lives. We're not saying turn up and in 10 years you'll feel so much better. We're saying right now you can experience a stilling of that inner voice. And it's honest also. To me, the important thing about being the good news is that our 
mission practices, our evangelism, comes out of not the things we think we know and have to share with people, but of our actual practices that do good for us. The things that we actually are. And yes, there is news there. There are things that people need to hear. But if we start with that, then we've lost people immediately. They're very sensitive to this sense of, they're out to convert me. Highly sensitive to that. But we have to be honest about our own story. As one of the people, one of the people in the focus group says, we all have a wobbly story. And I like this idea of a wobbly story. My story is exceedingly wobbly. <coughs> but sharing our wobbly story helps to make a connection with theirs. But it also takes seriously the spiritual aspect of everyone. If we are serious about there being the Augustinian God-shaped whole in everyone's life, then every time we help people to still that critical voice inside, to be quiet, we tread on holy ground here. So we tread lightly. We're listening and seeing sideways. That little quote of fox feet, deer ears, owl eyes, that's from Bruce Stanley who is um, the founder of Forest Church. And this is something he invites people to do. You tread lightly so you make no sound as foxes do. You have deer ears which hear in all directions the slightest sound behind as well as in front. And we have owl eyes which look out of the periphery, look sideways at things without moving. This is what we need in mission. Not to go in thinking we have the answers, but to go in treading softly, listening, seeing. And lastly, you'll be pleased to hear, the journey continues. The things to, I think we need to hold in mind, the things I'm still holding in mind is the idea of Missio Dei, which is the sort of the theological idea that, I mean, very much uh, comes from the work of David Bosch in Transforming Mission, um, that mission is not ours. We don't have mission. That actually it's God's mission. God sends Jesus. God the Father and Jesus send the Spirit. It's the mission of God. It's what Missio Dei means. And then we are participants in that because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are where it happens. And mission is therefore who we are and not what we do. We do good things. And I wouldn't decry that for a minute. It is important that we do the things which are about social justice, that we feed the hungry and visit the sick and those in prison and all that. Yes, of course we do. But the mission is who we are as we are doing it. We perform our apologetics, our explanation of the gospel. We don't tell people. We do it. We are it. And another lovely quote from Rowan Williams, we meet the other, whoever the other is, as an equal about whom we care, motivated by a spirit of love and not as the proprietors of a system. And this brings on to the, the idea of being a post-evangelical. For me in my evangelical days, I thought I had the system and I thought I knew what it was. But it was as I encountered people who were spiritually searching, as indeed I was, that I realized that the system was broken. And that actually I needed to be prepared to be changed by the very mission I was involved in. It wasn't just the people who I thought I was doing mission to. They changed me as much as more than the other way around. Hence, I would claim post-evangelical. But
But to me, post-evangelical, a contested term, I know, does not mean post-biblical. I know there are those who will say that, that, you know, lost the plot, not sound anymore. And I don't think that's too easy uh, a, a smear to throw at people. It is not post-biblical. It is wrestling, hungrily wrestling with scripture so that we can see what it means for the kind of people who do not come to listen to a sermon. Finally, the tensions which are really there, which are the same as in the church. With any new missional activity, who has the authority? Where does it come from? We, we happily say it's the mission of God. Well, who interprets that? To whom are we accountable? Well, I am accountable to the team rector, but I can go off and do my own thing. He doesn't actually come and check up on me. Probably will now. <laughs> Where do we draw the lines? Not all spiritualities are positive. How do we discern what is something that we can have a point of congruity with and what is not? What is our, if you like, theoretical grid that we can use to evaluate? And lastly, the biggest tension of all, I think, is money. Because if we are going out, as I am, and encountering people who will seriously never be a church in the way that we understand church to be, they will not be a bottom on a seat and putting, you know, converting their wallet and all that. But the money for fresh expressions, the resources, my job, come from the giving of the people who actually are there on a Sunday morning and the people who have been in previous generations as we are using their accumulated giving. And that is a big thing because I know one of the measures of fresh expressions is they're meant to be self-sustaining, but an awful lot of them never will be because we are not trying to create an institution. We are trying to enable a relationship, often a wobbly one, to use that lovely word. Therefore, where will the resources for the future come from? And it is a big tension, and one that I recognize. But to me, if there are all those people out there who will never come near a church what on earth are we doing staying inside our buildings doing churchy stuff why are we not enabling people to go out and that's what everyone says enablers actually it is simply about seeing where you are and joining in whatever there is, learning to speak that language and stopping doing the churchy stuff or some of it. But going out all the time with respect, fox feet, deer ears, owl eyes and seeing what is going on and being the good news in that particular place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.